Wise people will never venture into anything dangerous or disastrous. But foolish people never heed to the advice of the wise and indulge in foolish acts without any second thought. The book of Proverbs clearly supports this case. From our previous lesson of last Sunday morning in Proverbs chapter 14, Solomon had spent a considerable amount of time talking about the fool and his or her foolish behavior. Wisdom and understanding are both part of Solomon's goal in the purpose of his writing the book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verse 2 through 6. The person who has not found wisdom and understanding is unwise and lives a foolish life. On the other side of the coin, the one who has found wisdom and understanding is wise and lives a foolproof life. We often use the phrase, it's a foolproof plan. In other words, meaning that nothing can go wrong. Nothing can ruin it. This plan is foolproof. Nobody can ruin it. A fool in his behavior cannot ruin this plan. Well... Likewise, we can have a foolproof life. And I always love this picture of this man who is just sitting on the wrong side of the branch when he is cutting it. <laughs> I'm sure somebody has probably told this man, saying, hey, you know you're going to get yourself hurt. <laughs> nah, I'm fine. I know how to use a saw. That's not what I'm talking about, but okay. <laughs> okay. Solomon says... Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and understanding. Because the one who finds wisdom and understanding, as I said, is wise and lives a foolproof life. Last Sunday morning, in the first nine verses of Proverbs chapter 14, Solomon has discussed the fact that we need to consider our hands and conduct. A lot of what he discusses in the first nine verses relate to the way that we live and how we conduct our lives. Now normally, we sing a little children's song that says, Be careful little hands what you do. Our hands have been given to us because we use our hands to do things. Well, Solomon, in a way, says that you need to consider your hands and what they are doing. Consider how you conduct your life. And in the first nine verses, we discuss many things. And again, each proverb kind of stands alone, but it, uh, it focuses on an overall point that Solomon is making. And sure enough, you can just take each proverb, each verse, and just make it an entire sermon on its own. So we've kind of concised it, literally. I mean, you think that I'm a long-winded preacher? Well, I agree that I am. But sure enough, I mean, if I were to actually just go ahead and take each verse of Proverbs 14 and make an entire sermon over it, we'd be here forever. We'd be here forever. So we kind of concised it. And again, I won't be able to hit all the major you know, lessons and applications that um, uh, we can sit here and just discuss and talk about uh, for hours upon hours. But last Sunday morning, in regards to considering our hands and our conduct, the way that we live, Solomon says that you either construct or deconstruct. Verse 1. In other words, with your hands and your conduct and the way that you live, do you do more construction? Do you do more building up or do you do more tearing down? Specifically in verse 1 in the context, it relates to the wisest of women. And we talked a lot about how uh, uh, the influence that the, the woman and the wife and the mother has in the home. And Solomon says that, which kind are you? Are you the kind that gives an influence that builds up or an influence that tears down? He then goes on to say that we need to consider our hands and our conduct because does our conduct show that we are honest or hypocritical? Do we provoke 
or do we protect and preserve in regards to the way we use our mouth? Verse 3. Verse 4, do we tend to procrastinate the things that we ought to do that are beneficial, or do we prioritize and get them done? Verse 5, the way that we live and conduct our life and the way that we use our hands to do things, do they find us to be a trustworthy person or an untrustworthy person? Verse 5. Also, the way that we live our life and conduct our life, verse 6 and 7, does it show to others that we are teachable or unteachable? Are we willing to learn or are we stubborn and closed-minded? And then verse 8 and 9, our hands and our conduct show that we are either sensible or insensible. We either learn how to discern the things, look at it from a logical standpoint with objective truth and facts, or do we just tend to go with the flow and not care about how our life turns out to be? Which one is it? We stopped there because we ran out of time. And so this morning, we like to focus on verse 10 through 16, the second part of what Solomon tells us that we need to do in order to have a foolproof life. So not only do we ought to consider our hands and conduct, but also he says, consider your heart and choices. Consider your heart and choices. Let's go ahead and kind of read the context as one, continuing in verse 10 through 16. The heart knows its own bitterness, and no stranger shares its joy. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Even in laughter, the heart may ache, and the end of joy may be grief. The backslider and heart will be filled with the fruit of his ways, and a good man will be filled with the fruit of his ways. The simple or naive believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his steps. One who is wise is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is reckless and careless. <laughs> Notice how many times just in those uh, seven verses, 10 through 16, that Solomon uses the word heart. Notice how many times he uses the word heart. He uses it quite a bit in just that section right there. Well, because in this section, it involves and relates a lot to our heart and our choices that we make. And in verse 10... He wants us to consider our heart and our choices because our heart and our choices tend to have a lot of emotions behind it. He begins at verse 10 saying, The heart knows its own bitterness, and no stranger shares its joy. Now, the meaning of the Hebrew word for heart extends well beyond the organ itself. It represents the totality of a person. It is the seat and the chair of emotions, feelings, struggles, and joys. And so what Solomon is saying here is that there's much about an, an individual that we do not know. A lot about an individual person is unknown. When we observe others in just our day-to-day -day lives, we, can, we are just left with only external judgments, which may end up being very inaccurate. They say, don't judge a book by its cover. Read it on the inside. Well, when it comes to people, human beings like you and I, I mean, we can't. We can't do that. We can't read on the inside. It's unknown. We're just left with external, outside judgments that could be and become very inaccurate. It would be a mistake to assume that we know how another person feels. It would also be a mistake to even say the words, I know how you feel. Well, what if, uh, what if you're able to relate to the person because y'all have gone through the same struggles still? Still, you don't even know how they feel, even if you can relate with them. So it would be a mistake to even use the words, I know, how you feel, or I understand 
the pain and the feeling that you are dealing with. The pain, the depth of one's bitterness is not knowable outside of the person himself. Now, the Hebrew word that's used here for bitterness is not referring to a resentment, grudge-like mindset or attitude. Rather, the word is better translated as anguish or inner affliction. The message is that no one else can know your sadness, and strangers cannot share your joy. Now, the word stranger is not meant to convey a person that you do not know or not have seen. The idea is that everyone is a stranger when it comes to knowing the innermost thoughts and feelings of another person's heart. Now, one may be able to discern the mood that a person is going through by outward facial expressions, but we still cannot fully know another person's experience and what they're dealing with in their heart. Since this is true, we should choose our words very carefully when we empathize with others. Well, then what should we say? Sometimes, as I always said and I've mentioned before, sometimes the best thing to do is just not say anything. Just be there. Just be by their side. And if it's an awkward silence, let there be an awkward silence. During that awkward silence, I would encourage you to say an inward prayer for the person. And then ask them if you can pray out loud with them and for them. During the Bear Valley lectureship this past September, I was able to catch up with a very good friend of mine who had lost his son to leukemia over a year ago. While we were talking, he shared with me that he has an acquaintance whose son was lost recently to the same disease. I said to my friend, mistakenly, well, it's good that you can be there for your acquaintance because you can relate and know how he feels. Ah, big mistake on my part. To my surprise, he said, no, I do not. I do not know how he feels. I never will. Yes, we can relate, but I will never know how he feels. No one knows how another truly feels, even when their tragedies are similar. You know, that statement presented a new perspective to me. When it comes to knowing another person's heart, feelings, and emotions, everyone is an outsider, a complete stranger. Perhaps that is the reason why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in the first few verses, he says, don't judge a person's heart and motive. Now in chapter 5, he says, judge a person's actions. Yeah, you can judge a person's actions if their actions are showing a life of unrighteousness. And of course, in the context, it's the man that was sleeping with his uh, father's uh, wife. And so, yeah, judge that because that is unrighteous um, uh, conduct on his part. And God's word is completely against it. And so that is when we judge with righteous judgment, John 7, 24. But the chapter before, 1 Corinthians 4, Paul says when it comes to a person's motives and hearts, only God can see what's going on. Don't make that judgment. Leave that part into God's hands. No other proverb expresses the idea found here in chapter 14, verse 10. Now Psalm Chapter 44, verse 21, captures the truth of the matter when it says of God, for he knows the secrets of the heart. Brothers and sisters, this is why prayer is so valuable and powerful. We pray to the one who knows what we feel, who has intimate knowledge of our experience. No wonder it is why God is known as the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. We ought to consider 
our heart, and our choices. Because within them, there's a lot of emotions that goes on. And in our part, our part is never make judgments about someone's heart. Don't make any judgments about someone's heart because we don't know. We can't fully ever know what a person is truly dealing with on the inside of their heart. We ought to consider our hearts and our choices because they reflect what our outcome and destination will be. Verse 11 and 12, Solomon says, The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. Then verse 12, a very well-known verse that a, love, that a lot of us love to quote, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. This is actually so important that Solomon quotes it again, word for word, in chapter 16, verse 25. The Proverbs have frequently spoken of the wicked, a term that is used interchangeably with the word fool in the overall context. The wicked are individuals who have chosen to live a life that is in complete defiance of God's law. They do not recognize the authority of God, and they certainly do not fear Him whatsoever. Their life choices, however, will reap dire consequences in terms of their outcome and destination. The foolish person's house will be destroyed. Right now, we look at it, and it may seem that it is flourishing, but, but, the end result, the end, the conclusion of it all, their overall outcome and destination is destruction and death. Earlier, Solomon said that the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the house and the dwelling of the righteous. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 33. One of the aspects of the wicked and the foolish person is his or her failure to consider the outcome and destination of his or her choices. And folks, this is also true today. As men continue to pursue paths that run against the will of God. And they believe that the path that they have chosen is right. Read again verse 12. There is a way that seems uh, right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Few people have openly recognized that they are choosing a wicked lifestyle. They believe that their choices will give them the best and most rewarding life. But Solomon concludes that this man or woman's choice ends up being the way of death. This is why it is so important for us to consider our heart and our choices. Because the heart can be the most deceitful above all. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. And whatsoever a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, verse 7. Folks, if our heart is not in check, it can become the most deceitful tool above all things. So what valuable and wise lessons might we learn from Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12? Well, there's many, but I've got three Three major valuable lessons that we can learn from Proverbs 14, verse 12. Number one is that, first, people can be sincerely wrong. People can be sincerely wrong. This man in verse 12 went and chose a way that seemed right, that seemed best to him. So nothing in the verse indicates that we should question his sincerity. He did what he thought was right, and that was the mistake. What he thought was right. 
Many times, we have so many examples in the Old Testament of people doing what they thought was right, and its overall outcome and destination was utter ruin. The two best ones that I know on top of my head right now is Naaman, 2 Kings chapter 5. Behold, I thought he would have said, go to the Jordan River, because it's the cleanest one of them all, but he said, go to the dirty, uh, 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 the dirty Jordan River and to dip myself seven times. I thought he would have said, maybe some of these other rivers, the Nile or whatsoever, that's popular, that's clean, but no, he said the dirty river, so I'm mad. Well, Naaman thought, and he was wrong. He didn't like the outcome of it, but thankfully, he smartened up a little bit, thanks to his servant, who kind of branded some common sense in his mind and said, look, what's the big deal? What is the big deal? Do you want to stick with a permanent disease that's uncurable leprosy for the rest of your life? Just dip yourself seven times in the Jordan River and get it done with? Come on. So he did. There's also a second time where King David, King David, in 2 Samuel, he came up to the prophet uh, Nathaniel in chapter 7 and said, You know, I live in this nice little palace, and you know what? God doesn't have a place, so I'm going to go ahead and build him a beautiful temple, one that's even more grand than mine. Nathaniel the prophet said, Do whatever your heart's desire is. Big mistake. Big mistake. Many occurrences where people think that this path is the right and best one, but later on they find out that they're dead wrong. God did not spare this man in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. God did not spare him simply because he was sincere in his convictions. Today, many people are sincere in their religious convictions. They are convinced that the paths they uh, uh, pursue have merit. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 and 23, many, many people stand before Jesus convinced that they have faithfully served him. But to them, Jesus says, depart from me. Jesus does not say, you did not do what I wanted but you were sincere, therefore I will still save you. Did he say that? No. Rather, he said to them, depart, because you practice lawlessness. In the context, lawlessness was the opposite of the will of God. Even though their heart may be sincere, it was not according to the knowledge of the will and the righteousness of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 2 and verse 3. Sincerity is not good enough. We must ensure that we are teaching and living according to God's word, his will, his knowledge, and his righteousness. Second, we need to pay attention to God's directions. The Bible is our spiritual roadmap. I like to say it, it's the GPS, the God's plan of salvation, the GPS to get to our destination of heaven. It's our spiritual roadmap. Psalm 119, verse 102, the psalmist says, I have not turned aside from your ordinances, for you yourself have taught me. The wicked, foolish man... In Proverbs 14, verse 12, had good information, but he chose to ignore it. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, says that people are not able to direct their own lives. You try to direct your own life, in the end, it's just going to be the way of death. If you want to get to eternal life, if you want to get to the right path, the path that has the destination pointed upward to heaven and eternal life, God has it right here. God has it right here. Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, 
and the life. The right way is the way of Jesus that leads to life, life eternal. Folks, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what anybody says. It doesn't matter what we think. It doesn't matter what our feelings are or what our emotions may tell us. The only thing that matters in the end is what God has to say. The will of God is the only thing that matters. And it is the spiritual roadmap that will get us to heaven. We need to pay attention to God's directions. Three, wisdom demands that we consider the path we are on. Wisdom demands that we consider the path we are on. We should occasionally confirm that we are traveling on the right ro uh, road. The Bible is the only resource that can guide us in this manner. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. Proverbs 23, verse 23, Paul said, or Solomon says, Buy the truth and sell it not. The truth is the wisdom. The wisdom is God's wisdom. God's wisdom is Jesus Christ, the Word, who came in flesh and then who, through inspiration, wrote down inspired instructions, an inspired guide, a spiritual roadmap that can confirm that we are on the right track. If we follow its precepts, then we will walk in the way securely and our foot will not Stumble. Proverbs 3, verse 23. The Apostle John puts it this way. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever keeps his word, notice that. He uses his commandments and his word inter interchangeably. His word consists of the commandments. If we keep his word... Then the, uh, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. How is it that Sister Trish can know that she is saved? How can Sister Trish know that she needed to be baptized in order to be saved? Because of his word. We showed and studied with her what God has to say. And with her open and honest, truth-seeking heart, she said, I know what I need to do to be saved, to become a Christian. And she acted on it. By this, Sister Trish, you can know that you are in him. And we can know that we are in him if we keep his commandments and his word. Continuing on. Again, many other lessons that we can learn from Proverbs 14, 12, but... Sure enough, I believe the, these three right here uh, hit the nail right on the head. We ought to consider our heart and our choices because it affects our overall destination. Also, we need to consider our heart and our choices when it comes to making assumptions. Proverbs 14.13, Solomon goes on to say that even in laughter the heart may ache, and the end of joy may be grief. Now, notice how this proverb fits the overall context. In verse 10, we see that one cannot know what is in the heart of another. Verse 11, the wicked fool assumes that he has the best of things. And in verse 12, the wicked fool thinks that he is going the right way when he is not. In each of those verses, a false judgment might be made. Now in verse 13, Solomon notes that even in laughter, one cannot assume what is truly taking place in the heart. A person who may be laughing, a person who may have a smile on their face, may actually be in pain. Perhaps the person is attempting to be joyful in spite of the pain. Now this does not indicate hypocrisy, since some who are hurting sincerely try to encourage themselves when they are suffering. One would be wrong to assume from the laughter and smile that the person is happy. This is why I think it's important that we do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. 
We sometimes, whenever we want to, uh, to extend an act of kindness or a, an act of, um, uh, of a small gesture of, of kindness and encouragement, uh, we tend to first go to those that, uh, that we think that are just going through a hard time. Well, we say, well, brother or sister so-and-so, I mean, they seem to be doing well. I mean, they're always laughing and cracking jokes and smiling, so um, I guess, I mean, they're probably doing okay. Well, maybe they're not. Perhaps we should just go ahead and do acts of kindness to everyone. Because we don't know who's really hurting inside. Last Wednesday night, we used the example of Robin Williams, a man who's a comedic and a comedian, and he his his comedy was just you know pure gold. And some cases, in other cases, it was foolish comedy. But I look back at childhood movies like Flubber or Aladdin, where he plays genie, and it's just funny. Where he plays Peter Pan in the movie Hook with Dustin Hoffman. I mean, just great classics. I mean, he was the definition of laughter and comedy. And boy, was the whole world shocked when they found out, August of 2014, that he hung himself. I didn't think that he was having depression. He's always smiling. Well, because you're being <laughs> deceived by outward appearances. Just because a person's smiling doesn't mean that they're all going through unicorns and rainbows and butterflies and skittles and everything. They may truly be hurting on the inside. So yes, even when we see someone smiling or having a good laugh, still encourage them. Still give them some encouragement. Going on, because time's running short. Consider our heart and our choices because they have consequences. They have consequences. Verse 14, he says, The backslider in heart will be filled with the fruit of his ways, and a good man will be filled with the fruit of his ways. Now, people in Bible times knew the principle of reaping and sowing. The wicked may experience temporary victories, but in time, right order will be restored. A backslider, he says, is one who has proven to be disloyal and untrustworthy. At one point, he was following the correct path. He, but he abandoned that and now fully embraces a sinful path in his heart. All the good that he had done will now be forgotten when God judges him. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 24. Have you ever wondered why Jeremiah just pleaded and urged the people to return to the old paths? Return to the ancient paths? What is he saying? The, the old and ancient paths is God's path. Return to it before it's too late. In contrast, he says the good man will get his fill of God's rewards. Nothing will be left out. All of God's wonderful gifts will be fully received and experienced. Revelation 21, verse 4. The wicked will receive their reward and the righteous will receive theirs. Which side are you going to be on? Lastly, verse 15 and 16. He says, consider your heart and choices when it comes to making decisions. He says, the naive believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his steps. One who is wise is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is reckless and careless. Now the Hebrew word naive, some versions may have simple. Well, bad translation of the word. Because it's okay to be simple-minded. I'm a person that's like, you know, keep things simple. You know, don't speak in words that have more than five syllables because I'm not going to understand it. That's not what Solomon's talking about when he says simple. The better translation of the word is naive. A naive person is someone who is inexperienced, one who lacks intelligence and common sense. Because of this man's ignorance... He believes everything. He may fall prey to a financial scheme like the one proposed back in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 10 through 19. He is an easy target for prostitutes, chapter 7, verse 7, and is devoid of prudence, chapter 8, verse 5. When he sees evil, 
He is drawn to it easily and quickly. And as a result of it, he will be punished. Chapter 22, verse 3. But the opposite of the naive is the prudent man. One who studies situations thoroughly. One who applies reason and makes sound, logical judgments. His decisions are logical. Wisdom dwells with the person whose knowledge of God's word makes him prudent. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 12. He knows what God hates and he avoids it. With guidance from God, he is able to give thoughts to his steps so that he avoids pursuing the wrong and evil ways. Every person has to make the decision to grow up making mature, godly decisions. Verse 16 of Proverbs 14. The naive will grow up to become reckless and careless fools unless they eventually listen to wisdom. The prudent person took advantages of opportunities to learn from sound, godly teachers of the word and applied it in their life. And in doing so, they turn away from evil and avoid it. <clears throat> Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and understanding. Folks, if we want to foolproof our life, we need to consider our hands and our conduct. The way that we act and the way that we behave in this world. We ought to also consider our heart and our choices. Now that we know how to have a foolproof life, a lot of people may question, well, how do I first get wisdom and understanding? You said that in order to have a foolproof life, I need to have wisdom and understanding. Well, how do I get wisdom and understanding? Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. That is how you get it. A person who fears the Lord is a person who knows their place in this world. They are small, finite individuals who don't have everything figured out. And knowing the power and the almighty God, we have respect for him to the point that we know that he is the all-knowing God and that he knows what's best for us. And so I'm going to live my life in accordance to his word. To have a foolproof life, you need to have wisdom and understanding. To get wisdom and understanding, you must first fear the Lord. When you do, then you will want to live your life according to his word. Folks, if you have any need whatsoever, if you need to get some sin out of your life and get rid of it, ask uh, for uh, prayers for forgiveness, by all means, invitations extended for that as well. Perhaps there's someone who knows that they need to obey the gospel to be baptized into Christ, to have their sins washed away. God's plan of salvation, the destination that leads you to eternal life to heaven. If you have any need whatsoever, please come forward together as we stand and as we sing. I can hear my Savior calling. I can